everyone. Welcome to. Can we say it together? Kitchen Party. Kitchen party. <laughs> We try, we try, we try. Welcome I'm going to give you some of these, my bet. I know, you know, I've been, who did I see recently where they're like, oh, he's doing jazz hands, he's doing jazz hands. I don't know, it was maybe, I feel like it was Jay Leno, it was something, because I've been trying to watch his show before it's over, and um, there was like a whole big jazz hands thing that I thought, so someone, I'm, I'm, I'm above, I'm, a, I'm ahead of the curve, I'm ahead of the curve. Maybe um, we should get him on Kitchen Party. There's a lot of jazz hands in my house. Like my kids like the jazz hands. They do. How do they? they how do you? How do you? Okay. In what, in what context do you put jazz hands? Oh, uh, they're both you know performers. So. <laughs> uh, Emery's been obsessed with the score from Pippin lately because they're doing it at school and he's in the pit orchestra. So he walks around singing, "Gotta find my corner." Anyway. <laughs> Oh, see, I was thinking totally the opposite. I was thinking like, "Where's dinner?" Right. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, for those of you who are just tuning in, if you are a kitchen party fan, then you know where to find us every Thursday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. We bring our favorite people on food to come and talk to you directly. You get to ask questions on our Google Plus page or tweet us using the hashtag kitchen party. It's very easy to remember. If you have a question, if you're watching the show later after we've already aired live, we still follow the hashtag. So please uh, go ahead and leave a question and we will follow up. Um, today I'm really excited. Uh, before we uh, move on to our guests, I just want to say I'm Babette Pepe. I'm the founder of Bakespace.com and also an entrepreneur. So I'm really excited about this topic today. My co-host is Renee Lynch. Renee, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Sure, I'm a staff writer and editor at the LA Times. I write across a number of sections, including home health and, of course, food. Food. And I'm looking. I'm looking forward to being here tonight because I I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm I'm so I'm just so proud of the way Erica has put together this food line. I want to hear details so I can bottle my father's famous spaghetti sauce or something. I become rich. I become rich. <laughs> <laughs> become rich. <laughs> That's the real question I want answered. <laughs> we automatically go from like, hmm. I can become rich, which is, I guess, it, that's good motivation. That's very good motivation. Um, but just think of, like, the Mrs. Fields. Like, there's people out there who are going to be the next Mrs. Fields. Like, there are me, people out me, there. Me, yes, me. Exactly. exactly. So our topic today on today's show is how to start a food business. And if you're interested in finding out how you take a product from literally the idea to getting it out onto the market to then marketing it, because I think once you get it out on the market, it's only you're only halfway there. Now you got to figure out how to get attention, how to get in stores um, with the overcrowded shelf space um, or with with crowded shelf space. How do you uh, how do you get on those um, those those store buyers uh, radar? And so uh, an LA food blogger who we know just did that. Uh, she basically Erica Karakesh from In Erica's Kitchen uh, came up with an idea for a new product and we've in the LA food scene we have just like seen her go from uh, blogging about food to all of a sudden she is now a manager of an entire food line. <laughs> so Erica, welcome to Kitchen Potty. I know we've had you. you on before, so you're an old pro at this. Um, but for those of you who are just to, for tuning in, can you tell uh, the folks a little bit about your background just so that they can get an idea if they, if they hadn't heard of your site before? Sure. Um, so my food blog is called In Erica's Kitchen. I'm in Santa Monica. I've been blogging about family-friendly recipes for about five years. Um, by trade, I'm an online marketing consultant, and so having a marketing background, I have to say, really helps when you're trying to do something like start a business. So I'll just put that out there. Anything that you think you know about marketing, just make sure that you keep that front and center and um, nurture that because that is really going to help you as you're getting your food business started. Um, and so I started this business called Not Ketchup. Not Ketchup. Um, it's actually been in the bottle four weeks. It was four weeks yesterday. It feels like forever, but I've been working on it since the summer, really. And, um, yeah, and so it's just it's been great so far, and I'm really looking forward to taking not ketchup to every supermarket shelf. I don't have small ambitions. Every supermarket shelf in America, it's going to be the thing that you put on your, your food that's not ketchup. Everything that's not ketchup is going to have my brand on it. Okay, so w when was the moment where you're like, hmm, 
I have an idea. Did you already have this recipe before? And then you're like, so I should actually package this. Can you kind of walk us through that? Sure. Well, actually, it was almost an accident. Um, you know, every summer, my kids and I go to pick cherries in Leona Valley, which is near Palmdale. It's this tiny little town that nobody ever goes to except for three weeks in June when the cherry trees are blooming. And there are a lot of pick-your-own places there. We've been going there every year for, I don't know, 10 years or something. Well, my boys are bigger now, and they can pick a lot of cherries. And so we came home with 30 pounds of cherries from Leona Valley, just this, these huge bags. And um, I've always been kind of a condiment person. You know, my extra refrigerator downstairs is always full of pickles and chutney and jam and whatever. I'm lazy. I don't do, like, proper canning procedures, so they're all in the refrigerator so that I don't have to worry about disinfecting them. Um, and, you know, I had 30 pounds of cherries, and I made cherry pie, and I made cherry cobbler, and I made cherry slump, and I made a lot of jam. And I was totally sick of jam, and I still had 15 pounds of cherries left. And, you know, I had given away a lot of jam. We don't actually eat that much jam. And I, I went to bed thinking, ugh, these 15 pounds of cherries that we paid a lot of money for and picked ourselves are going to go bad. What can I do with them? And I literally woke up the next morning and rolled over and thought, huh, I wonder if you can make ketchup out of cherries. It, it almost it feels like it came to me in a dream. Um, and so I went and did a little research and realized that actually tomato ketchup is a relatively new invention. Um, and if you look in old cookbooks, like I have this old cookbook called the Yankee Cookbook, um, and it's recipes from New England that go back to colonial times. There are recipes in there for grape ketchup and currant ketchup and you know ketchup made from apples and all kinds of weird things. And so basically ketchup is a fruit and some vinegar and sugar and spices. and you know, that's what ketchup is. So um, I started playing around with ketchup, and I made ketchup out of cherries. Then I made ketchup out of plums, kiwis, loquats, apricots, grapes, carrots, um, like pretty much everything I could get my hand on, I tried making ketchup out of it. Pineapple. Was there anything um, that didn't work? Uh, the strawberry ketchup was really strange. Uh, I didn't like it. There were other people who liked it, and uh, I, I couldn't deal with it. It was very, you know how strawberries, especially really ripe ones, have that very floral kind of, it didn't work for me in ketchup. Uh, but the kiwi ketchup was amazing, except it turned brown, and I couldn't figure out how to keep it green. And so, you know, this is, so one of the lessons learned is that when you're developing a recipe that you then want to take on to become a packaged food product, there are so many considerations, not just does it taste good, but how does it look? And are you going to be able to get a consistent texture? And um, can you afford to put it in the bottle? And you know all these concerns. So I made ketchup out of a lot of different things. Um, the things that really worked for me are the ones that I started with, which is um, cherry. This is cherry chipotle, not ketchup. It's cherry with a little bit of chipotle powder, a little bit of heat. Um, and then the second one that I developed was blueberry, but you know these are savory sauces, so I wanted to pair the fruit with something that was a little it, it, not sweet. It doesn't. It shouldn't taste like jam or syrup. It really has to taste like ketchup. So the blueberry has white pepper in it that gives it sort of a back a back end heat. And then the third one that I did is smoky date. Now this was actually really interesting because I actually had in mind, you know, those bacon wrapped dates that you get at a lot of restaurants. Now that's kind of what I was going for, but the factory that I'm producing in doesn't do meat. They're not USDA certified. And so, you know, then my question to my food chemist, and we'll talk about him in a minute, was, well, how do I get that smoky flavor? And he said, liquid smoke. And I said, no, I don't, I don't really want to do that. I don't want it to say natural smoke flavor on the label. And he said, well, that's how you do it. And I was like, no, there must be an alternative. And so I did some research. And um, so I ended up flavoring this one with smoked paprika, which gives it not only the, a little bit of smoky flavor, nothing like you would get with a liquid smoke, but you guys know what that tastes like. It's, it's really artificial tasting. It tastes like you know lighter fluid kind of. Um, so this is a subtle smoke, plus it has the, the sort of heat, uh, not heat, but the, the peppery taste of the smoke, of the paprika. It's not spicy. Um, it's just kind of warm. Hey, Renee, have you ever had smoked paprika? 
Yes, it's fantastic. I love it. I love it. And I think it was such a clever idea to turn to that for that um, for that smoky flavor. Um, I've tried all three of the um, of the dipping sauces, and I have to tell you, Erica, I love the the smoky um, the smoky date one. You it do. Is just, That's great. Yeah. I served it at a Super Bowl party this weekend. I did. Um, uh, uh, Louisiana hot links and I cut them on the bias and just like sauteed them in a um, nonstick skillet you didn't really need any oil or anything and then I uh, did it with a dipping sauce and put out uh, toothpicks and and they it just it went like that I so can't people believe, liked it. oh people loved it people oh, loved it good. and it's just it was just a great little dip because it's a little that's a the sausage is a little spicy and then this is a touch sweet but not too sweet but you have all that um, smokiness to it it was really popular it was a hit I'm so glad to hear that. So this is this is the best thing about creating a business like this is when I hear people tell me that they really like it. And that feeling you get, you know, when people say like your kids are cute or they like the way your house is decorated, it's like that times a thousand when people tell you that they like the product that I made. Um, so yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. I'm really glad to hear that. Okay, well let me also tell you this. My husband has been this is so weird. He has been putting the blueberry on his eggs, <laughs> his scrambled okay. eggs. And I'm like, I have not been able to go there because I think anything <laughs> sweet with eggs might. And I know it's not so sweet, but still, I'm just, I haven't been able to go there. But he has been putting it on his eggs, and he said, tell Erica, that's the best combo so far. So okay. there you go. <laughs> that's great. You know, the funny thing is, if you look at the... If you look at the labels, they actually have about the same level of sugar as a regular ke a tomato ketchup, Heinz ketchup. Mm -hmm. It's about the same. But because we're not used to savory with fruit, like it's a it's a different taste, the perception is that they are sweeter than ketchup. They're actually not. They're the same. So just in case that makes you feel less right. weird about <laughs> Blueberry on eggs. Yeah, I still, I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. I haven't tried it yet, but still, blueberry and eggs is a little, although I guess, you know, you can have eggs with like a side of blueberry, so I don't know. I just got to get over it and go for it. Actually, <laughs> at our Food Bloggers Los Angeles meeting this weekend, um, Patty Laundre from Worth the Whisk made um, deviled eggs, and she actually mixed the blueberry nut ketchup into the centers of some of the deviled eggs. Ooh. She made some with the cherry chipotle and some with the blueberry, and they were really delicious. Really, really quite delicious. So, who knows? I Good know other experiment. people were putting the blueberry on their oatmeal and on ice cream, which, uh, you know, I always envisioned these as ketchup, like savory ketchup. And people are doing all kinds of interesting things with them. Kim Watkinson from uh, Baking Ninja took the blueberry and made cupcakes out of it. And the it's got in the cupcake and plus in the frosting. And I haven't tasted them, but she blogged about it and she said they were fantastic. So, hey, if I created something versatile enough to go from breakfast to sausages to cupcakes, fine with me. How did you come up with the name? Well, so... <clears throat> and did you have any legal stuff that you had to start doing? So that's a great question. Um, in the United States, the FDA actually has, there are a lot of rules and regulations about food labeling. And the FDA actually has a rule, probably thanks to the Heinz lobby, that says that you're not allowed to call something ketchup if it doesn't have tomatoes in it. And in fact, it has to have a certain percentage of tomato solids in it in order to be able to label it either ketchup or catsup. And so this line right here that says dipping sauce Obviously, what I thought I was going to put there at first was fruit ketchup or something like that. And I couldn't because, um, because I wasn't allowed to. So in trying to figure out what the brand was going to be, I bought a whole bunch of domains like you know organic fruit ketchup when I thought I was going to be doing it organic and Erica's Pantry and all kinds of other things. And then I thought, you know, I really want somehow to be able to have people associate it with ketchup. But it's, it's not ketchup, so, oh, it's not ketchup. Not ketchup. And so I went and looked it up, and it was available, and I bought it, and I, I thought about it for a few days, and I tested it on a bunch of people, and a few people thought, well, you know, it's kind of weird to call a brand something that's a negative, but it's worked really well. When I had it at the Fancy Food Show a few weeks ago, people would walk by, and they'd stop, and they'd say, not ketchup. If, it, if it's not ketchup, what is it? And that would, of course, give me the opportunity to say, well, it's not ketchup because it doesn't have tomatoes in it. Really easy answer. 
So, what, what was the process of trademarking that for the, for um, the folks who are thinking about trademarking a company? So, the, my process was I called my friend Carolyn, who's a trademark attorney, and said, "Hey, I need a trademark." And she said, "Okay, sign here, pay me some money, we'll just get that going." So she did it for me. Um, I, you know, I personally think there are certain things you can do yourself, and certain things you don't want to fool around with. And for me, if I'm building a serious business. I want to make sure my trademark is protected. I'm calling a lawyer and making sure it gets done properly. And you know, when you're starting a business like this, you have to decide how much money are you willing to put into it to get it going. And for me, I wanted to make sure there were certain things that were non-negotiable for me. Um, it was non-negotiable that I needed to pay a lawyer, I needed to buy liability insurance, I needed to pay someone to develop my website because I probably could have done it myself, but I just didn't have the time. Um, things like that. There, that were not, you know, I, I knew I had to do them. I had to set aside the money to get that done. Um, there were other things that I did a lot of myself, particularly the marketing stuff, because that's what I'm good at and what I do for a living. I suppose if I were a trademark lawyer, I probably would have done that part myself and outsourced the marketing. But you know, got to play to your strengths. So. Um, so that's how I did it was I called my friend Carolyn Shining and she took care of it. Uh, international trademark and this is something actually that I was talking to uh, Melissa of the Fresh 20 about at Tech Munch last week. Um, she sat me down, she was very stern with me and she said make sure you have international trademark protection because if you're selling in Canada or Mexico which are you know likely to be the first international um, international sales that I make, she said you need to be protected there too. So, so now I am. Or that that is a very good point about international. Um, I hadn't we, thought about that actually. Yeah, you know, we just Pretty filed nice. our utility patent, and I got to tell you, it was the longest process of my life. <laughs> I was like, I was so over just that process that I was like, I don't want to do this again. Um, but it's 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 comforting to know that you have you've started the process to make sure that if anything does happen, if somebody does like try to produce the recipe um, that you're that you're at least protected or at least you have the right to say hey stop this we're gonna we're gonna make some trouble for you any any up to that point of when you came up with the idea any mistakes you made along the way um well I guess it depends how you define mistake um, what I did after I had a recipe or a set of recipes was I started looking for co-packers or contract manufacturers because <coughs> there are basically three ways you can go when you're doing a product like this. You can either make it in your own kitchen under the cottage food laws which are new to California but other states have had them and this product because it's um, pasteurized and high acid I think would be okay under cottage food laws. Sorry, hold on, I'm going to mute you for a second because I have to cough. I'd have to find the mute button. Oh, Here. that's not the mute button. I was like, there Renee and I will talk. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, if you if you could think of a company of like a food thing, what would you what would you come up with? What would you, know, you invent? Would, my father makes the most incredible spaghetti, like a marinara sauce. That's amazing. So I think that uh, that that would be great. And my mom makes these fantastic. Um, they're kind of like very rustic uh, sweet potato turnovers. And I think it would be impossible to mass produce because they're just so handmade. I mean, my you, my mom, you'll see the her imprints of her fingers on it. Um, so I think it would be hard to mass produce, but uh, she makes them. They're the best. So I think I would do that. <laughs> well, so they might be hard to mass produce exactly the way she does it. Right. But you know, again, remember that, and this is something that I learned from Barry Weinstein, my my food technologist or food chemist. <clears throat> He said, the product you make in your kitchen is food. The product we put in the bottle is a food product. And those are two different things. And they require different processes and different kinds of ingredients. And the end product is different from what I turned out, similar to, but different in some ways. Um, How did you feel about that? Because you're, you're such a food purist. I mean, you you know, what you do is create food. And now somebody's telling you we're turning it into a food product. How did you feel about that? Well, so here's the trade-off. The way I made it in my kitchen, I would never be able to afford to sell it because I was making it from real cherries, which are 85% water and still cost, what, $4 a pound mm -hmm. at least. 
So um, I, I think the reality of building a business around something sort of took some of the pride out of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you have to figure out if it's going to work, if the numbers are going to work. Because if the numbers aren't going to work, you don't have a business and you're not going to be able to afford to keep making it and then you're giving people some very nice gifts, but it's not the same thing. So uh, I think I there were certain compromises that I did not want to make and there were certain compromises I felt I had to make and I can talk about those. Um, but Babette was asking about mistakes. So I think one, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but I have learned along the way that as I formulate new flavors, uh, the very first thing I'm looking at is, is the main fruit ingredient available in the format that I need and is it affordable? And so those two things, you know, rather than deciding, well, I wanna make plum ketchup. Well, guess what? Plums are really hard to find in uh, an unsulfured, which it needs to be if you want to conform to Whole Foods standards, unsulfured, unsweetened, and not the color of prunes, right? So the plum ketchup I made in my kitchen is this gorgeous kind of purplish mauve, it was absolutely beautiful. Ketchup made out of prunes does not take that color, <laughs> and um, I haven't been able to find a suitable unsulfured dried plum product that would make it the right color. So, uh, whereas in the beginning I said, I'm doing cherry and I'm doing blueberry. Those were the first two. Those are the ones I'm gonna do and it took me a long time to find the right fruit ingredient and frankly, those fruits are very expensive and so the cherry and the blueberry are the products on which I have lower margins because the costs are much higher to produce. This is, you know, if you look at salad dressing, so I've gotten pretty good now at looking at things in a bottle and figuring out how much did it cost to make that. Um, if oh you God, you got to tell us, you got to, you got to, is there like a formula that we, we could learn from? Yeah, fruit is expensive and everything else is cheap. It's basically what it comes down to. Um, if you look at salad dressing, for example, salad dressing is oil, vinegar, usually water, some thickeners, and some spices. Every bottle of salad dressing, and let this be a lesson to you, paying for salad dressing is a total ripoff because every bottle of salad dressing that you pay $4 for costs like 25 cents of ingredients. It's maybe 25 cents of ingredients, not much more. Um, so, <clears throat> so I think that perhaps one naivete, I don't want to call it a mistake, was starting with two fruits that are very expensive, which means my costs are high. But um, dates are not as expensive, and that was actually why I prioritized the smoky date for the third flavor rather than pursuing some of the others that I had looked at, like apricot or uh, kiwi or plum or you know some of the others, raspberry, cranberry. I, I've made ketchup literally out of everything except your shoes. Um, <laughs> You know, Erica, you brought up a good point about, you mentioned Whole Foods, because we, we work with them. Um, they're one of our, our main sponsors at our Food Blogger Conference called Tech Munch, which um, is going to be March uh, 9th in Austin, Texas. Um, there are so many companies that we talk to that come to our conference because they're basically getting an opportunity to, to meet Whole Foods and be in the room with them. Um, but I've never asked them if when they developed their product, if they had Whole Foods or Gelson's or one of these rest, you know, these 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 rest um, these stores in mind when they actually started developing the product. And it almost sounded like you said I did. As, yeah. So you you were like, okay, I know where it's going to go. Because um, I'd heard from like I'd heard somebody um, who was a beer company, and they were trying to sell to Trader Joe's, and Trader Joe's wanted them to knock the price down so much that he couldn't. It would be below what it costs to actually manufacture the, uh, well, the product. And big retail chains are always going to try to do that. And it's your job as the creator of the product to say, I'm sorry, that's a line below which I cannot go because I will lose money on every single bottle. I did have to say that, actually, to, uh, to a distributor recently. You know, We were talking about pricing for a, a big retail customer. And he said, well, they want to put it on the shelf at this and that means that our cost has to be this. And I said, I can't sell it to you for that cost because I will lose money and I'm not gonna do that. So, and he said, well, where do you need it to be? And then I named a number and he went back to them and we worked it out. So, um, 
so you have to be very conscious, and I, I think that goes back to the, the issue I mentioned before about understanding your business model. You really have to know not just what your ingredients cost and not just what your manufacturer or what the labor is going to cost you to put it in the bottle and not just what the label costs and the bottle itself, but you need to know things like how much are you going to need to percentage to give to a distributor? How much of a percentage is going to a food broker or a sales rep who might be getting you into that customer? How much of a percentage do you need to allow for breakage or spoilage? How much do you need to allow for promotions when they want to put it on sale? You pay for that as the manufacturer. So, you know, building a business model around this, and I was very lucky. I, um, I have a, 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 the uncle of a good friend who is a natural foods manufacturer and distributor, been in this business a long time, and he sat me down and, like, for two hours, we just sat there and ran numbers. Um, so that I could understand all the elements involved in the cost of doing business like this. So um, getting back to, I think we got distracted from the original question, which was, um, I said there are three ways you can do it. You can either do it in your kitchen under cottage food laws, or you can go to a commercial kitchen, a licensed commercial kitchen, and you can make your product there. Or you can pay a contract manufacturer or uh, so for wet items, that's called a co-packer. Um, it might be a contract bakery if it's a baked good. You can go to basically a business that this is what they do. They take your recipe or your formula and they make it for you and you pay them to do that. Um, and that's the way I decided to go because I knew that I did not want to be in a commercial kitchen at 3 in the morning filling bottles. You just can't scale a business that way. Now, if you, if you know that for the first two years, all you want to do is sell at the farmer's market, and you can make enough all week so that when you go to the farmer's market on Sunday, you can then sell it, great. That's not the kind of business I wanted to build. I wanted to build something that was going to scale up faster than that. And so, so after I had my recipe, and I, um, I have a friend who has a cookie business. It's called Laura's Wholesome Junk Food. It's sold at Whole Foods. And you know, I learned a lot from her over the years about how she developed her recipes. And one thing I knew was that whenever she was developing a recipe, she was always doing it by weight in grams. So um, instead of having a recipe that said a half cup of this and a quarter cup of this, I had a recipe that said 500 grams of fruit and 250 whatevers and 250 whatevers. And, and so it was already kind of formulaic. So I started researching co-packers in Southern California. Uh, most of them deal with much bigger businesses and uh, had very large minimums. So if you're going to make your product, you're going to have to make 5,000 cases at a time. And I knew I wasn't anywhere near that scale. But I found uh, there are a few co-packers who work with smaller companies. Um, and I decided to work with a company called Hyden's Foods, which is in Fullerton, California. It's run by a um, husband and wife. It's a family-owned business. Did you think um, it was important to have somebody local so that you could go into the, the property? Because I, I always hear people yeah. that are like, you need to take it overseas, you need to take it overseas. Oh, I'm like, yeah. Well, for a food product, I certainly wasn't going anywhere overseas. And in fact, all my ingredients are um, domestically sourced as well. I just or I, maybe except for the spices, but you know the sugar is from Florida and the um, the cherries and the blueberries and the dates are from the West Coast and I just I was not going overseas for anything and I think for something like this especially at the beginning yeah I wanted to be there I wanted to be there to watch that stuff go in the tanks um, so anyway I found Heightens and they were very good about walking me through all the parts of the process so. You know, he said, okay, the first thing you need to do is hire an independent food technologist. And he gave me a list of people that they work with. Um, and that person is going to take your recipe and develop what's called the manufacturer's formula, which is the formula that gets submitted to the state for approvals, along with a process, a manufacturing process that also gets approved by the state. And then I own that. So I own the formulas. The, the factory doesn't own it. I own the formulas. I share them with the factory under a non-disclosure agreement so that they can make the product. Um, and so he said, okay, hire your food technologist. So I interviewed three and one wasn't taking new clients and one was a little obnoxious. And the third one reminded me of my dad. We had a great conversation. And um, 
and I've been working with him ever since. His name is Barry Weinstein. He's fantastic. And I think the thing that's been really helpful for me is that he's taught me a lot about the economics of this business. I mean, he's made food products for 30 years for Campbell's and Hunt Wesson and really big companies. And so, um, you know, when he said to me, I would say things like, oh, well, if that ingredient costs five cents more a bottle, that doesn't matter. And he said, oh, yes, it does. Yes, five cents matters. We need to really think about this. Um, so I feel like it's been a good mentorship. I've also gone in with some strong ideas of my own and been willing to be flexible in other ideas. So uh, we started with the cherry chipotle and we experimented and tried uh, one cherry ingredient and I wasn't really happy with the way it came out. So most products like this, um, most products like this are formulated with fruit concentrates, which are um, sort of the consistency of heavy cream and they're bright, bright in color and they're natural, but they're concentrates. It's sort of like, uh, it's the equivalent of like frozen lemonade, I guess. Um, and we made one batch out of that, and I just, I wasn't happy. It didn't have the right depth of flavor. I, I just, and I, I went home and thought about it, and I thought, you know, I don't want the first ingredient on my label to be cherry concentrate. I wanted it to be cherries. And so I called him back and I said, I know you're not going to like this because I know it's going to be more expensive and harder, but this is what it has to be for marketing reasons I need it to be this. And so we worked together and I found um, a cherry paste, which is basically dried cherries that are put through a meat grinder and um, sourced that from a company in uh, Washington State, I believe. Um, and Okay, so then we started building a formula around that. And we use a combination of cherries and dates in the cherry product because I actually really liked the flavor that the dates gave and it allowed me to cut back on the added sugar some because dates bring a lot of sugar to it. So the formulation process of you know going through and testing, is it's really fun. Um, you know, you make a batch, you make it in a blender, and you heat it up on the little stove in the back of the factory, and then you take it home, you know, you pour it into a bottle, you take it home, and two days later you open it and you think, okay, is it too sweet? Does it have enough vinegar? Does it need more salt? Can you taste the onions? And, you know, there's sort of this, this process while you taste it yourself, and then you give it to your family, and then you have friends come over, and you try to decide is this the right flavor profile? And so for the cherry, we went through four or five rounds of testing, actually, till I was happy with the flavor profile. And then... How the costly is that? How, how much, like, in terms of, like, for people at home who are thinking about doing something like this, how expensive is that experimenting? So uh, it depends whom you hire. Barry's not cheap because, as I said, 30 years, Campbell's, Hunt Wesson, whatever. Uh, I would say it averaged out to about um, maybe between the average I think was 1500 to 2000 bucks per flavor. Um, the first one cost more and then we used that formula, we kind of replicated that and based our subsequent tests on the successful formula and so it didn't take us as long for the second two. I mean all in and, and I said this in the, um, the article that Renee wrote for the LA Times about not ketchup. I mean, all in, including insurance and marketing materials and the formulation and the ingredients and paying the factory. And all. I mean, I've spent about fifteen thousand dollars so far, a little bit more. Um, that's but, not know, bad. That's not. That's it's, not. Uh, it's not I, bad. It's a lot people, less. People than, spend that on like a Facebook ad campaign. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a lot less than it might otherwise cost. Um, and part of the reason is that when you're doing it through a contract manufacturer, I don't have any, I'm not building a factory, I'm not hiring people, I'm saying to them, please make this, here's a check. So, you know, it's a trade-off. You have to be willing to hand over the money and, and hand over some control. But, you know, if it's a good relationship, it's more like a partnership anyway. You know, I, was, um, I have to confess, I watched this show called The Shaws of Sunset. I don't know if anyone watched it. Oh, I like it. that show. <laughs> I love, and I've been, I've been obsessed with their diamond water. You know, like, just the process, like, Asa's going to go, and she puts her diamond water, and she, like, prays on it and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and I was thinking how exciting for her family. They walked around 
um, there was a moment where the, the three of them, her father, her mother, and her walked around the factory for the first time, and she had like the little thing on her head, which the first time she wouldn't put it on her head, it was hysterical. Um, but there was a sense of pride of like, oh my gosh, I just gave birth to this, you know? Did you have that feeling? I did, and if you go and look at the Not Ketchup Instagram feed, you can look back and see some of those pictures. I literally cried as the first bottles were coming around the on the conveyor belt. I, I mean, not I mean, it was a lot of work, and especially because I have another business, I have a marketing consulting business that I've been working on this whole time as well, because that's what's paying the bills for this startup business. So, I mean, between Thanksgiving and now, I haven't taken a day off since before Thanksgiving, which is normal if you're starting a business, but that moment where I saw the first bottles rolling off just felt like such a culmination of really months and months of work and hope and dreams and and then, you know, then you realize that, okay, now you have the stuff, you got to go sell it. That's the hard part. So... You yeah. know, but before we move on to the selling part and the marketing part, uh, and Renee, you may have some questions too. Um, well, how did you pick the bottle, the, the shape, and did any anything particular go into that? Because of course, you know, the diamond water thing. You know, she wanted the certain bottle, the certain yeah. shape. And uh, so you... here's here's the advice that I got as I was sitting around the table the first day with the owner of Hyden's and Barry, my food technologist. They said. I don't think they actually called me sweetie, but there was kind of an implied sweetie. Sweetie, we've been around the block. We've seen a lot of people in your shoes. Get a bottle that you can always get just a standard bottle and spend your money on the label. They said the label is what makes people pick it up off the shelf. And so I actually chose a standard 12 ounce ring neck bottle. So it's called ring neck because it has this little ridge right here. If you go to Whole Foods and look at the barbecue sauce aisle, you'll see 20 sauces in this exact bottle. But the reason is it's always available, it is not expensive, and you spend your money on the design and printing of the label. So, <coughs> excuse me, my label, I don't know, you probably can't see it here, but my label has, let me hold it up a little bit. Um, so the background is a black, kind of a, a matte black, and then the colors have a special printing process on them called a spot varnish, because I really wanted the colors to pop, almost like they were iridescent or something. Um, that cost extra money to do it that way, but I thought it was really important because I wanted the label to look classy, and yet I wanted it to really stand out. And so you know, when you look at the shiny part of the color and the, the black matte, that definitely is a more expensive printing process, but the bottle itself, um, I actually asked them, I said, hey, you know, I've been, I've done a lot of work with Palm Wonderful and the people who own Roll International, and one of the things, you know, the, the Palm Wonderful bottle is very iconic, so iconic that they couldn't actually get anybody else to make it for them. They had to build a whole part of the plant just to make the bottles to get them the way they wanted it to. Fiji water, again, a very distinctive bottle, and they looked at me and they rolled their eyes and they said, when you have as much money as Linda Resnick, you can get a bottle <laughs> that's iconic and says your brand. Until then, really, just choose a bottle and spend your money on the label. Does that answer your question? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So now we're... we're Oh, go ahead, Renee. I'm sorry. Um, it seems like from day one, um, you envisioned this not just as a, a food line, but really as a business with big aspirations. And I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. This is something that came up uh, last week when we were at the TechMunch uh, conference, that at some people sometimes have trouble trying to embrace that big picture that big picture look and going for that brass ring and it seems like from day one you were like, this is going to be a business, it's going to be big, and I'm thinking that big from day one. Talk yeah, about that. I, I mean, people who know me know that I'm not generally somebody who, I, I'm not the wallflower type. Like, if I'm going to do it, I'm really going to do it. And once I realized that, it's sort of a combination of things. One is, it's a good product, and people really seem to like it. I haven't had too many people who tasted it and said, meh, you know. Once people taste it, they really like it. So that was number one. Number two was, it. there's nothing like this on the market. There there is no category of fruit ketchup. Um, it's not like this is the 10th product in a line on the shelf of lots of different fruit ketchups. And when I walked around the fancy food show, one of the things I noticed is that there are probably 
five other products somewhere out there that might have tasted like this, but they weren't branded the same way, right? They weren't trying to set themselves up in this new category. They were called like grilling glaze or marinade or fruit sauce or whatever. Um, so, so number one, it was a good product. Number two, I felt like there was a hole in the market. And number three, I'm not shy about saying that I want to make money. I want to pay for my, co my kids' college education. I want to get out of debt. I want to pay off my house. I want to do all these things. And thinking small was not going to get me there. And so when I realized that the investment was my time and not that much money compared with what it could have been if I was doing a different kind of business, I just figured there's no reason not to do it. I, I don't want to build a business that's going to throw off 20,000 extra dollars a year. You know, I, I'm a marketing consultant. I make, you know, there are other ways I can make an extra $20,000 that wouldn't cost me as much time as this. Um, not, I don't mean to sound, uh, that might have come out a little bit not humble enough, but you know what I mean. Like, I have a day job for the, the money money. If I'm going to do this, it's because I really want to blow it out. And um, I will tell you that there is certainly a part of me that's nervous about that and kind of scared and not sure I can do it and all that, but I'm trying to keep that part very well. I just got to push it down and keep going because otherwise it won't happen. Well, I, I appreciate you talking about that because I do think that um, uh, this is like totally generalizing, but I think too often women maybe we're sometimes afraid to kind of go for it and afraid to really put what we want out there. And I love that that you just decided from day one what you wanted, and then that meant you were going to put all that work behind it to make it happen. And uh, I'd like to see other people who have dreams, no matter what what it is, kind of go for it and seize it like that. So I, I appreciate you. Um, talking about that and I think it will inspire other people to do the same. I hope so and I will also say that my husband is super supportive. I mean he's been he's just been so great about this from everything from I realize it's 730 and I haven't done anything about dinner and I call him and he'll you know deal with the kids to he drove around with me two days after it was in the bottles. We drove around for six hours delivering samples to food bloggers and food writers and PR people to, I mean, he's just, he's constantly saying, you can do this, we can do this. And um, I think without that support from my partner, I don't know that it would have been as easy to just keep going saying, yes, I'm going to do it. Yes, I'm going to do it. He's been amazing. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these super sappy, I love you, I love you, he's the best, I mean, he's wonderful, he is a great guy, but having a supportive partner who really not only believes that you can do it, but is willing to help make it happen is really, I can't, I can't stress the importance of that. Um, Erica, you touched on a, on a really sensitive spot for me because I, I feel the exact same way. I, well, I you think, can see it at Tech Munch, I mean, Oh you man, can see if, it. if I did not have a strong, wonderful person who who forced me to be better. Like every day, it's it, if if I if I show Eric something like uh, an email or something that's like written, like I just uh, threw it together. I don't have time. I don't have time. He will literally call me on it, <laughs> not because he thinks it's bad, but because he knows I can do better. And so, just having that kind of that strength that you're doing something and you have that um, that that companionship through that process because this is a very I mean if blogging is a lonely time like building a business and actually putting your hard cash and everything into um, building a product that you have to then go out and try to promote um, is extremely I would imagine it extremely difficult um, but you did mention something um, when you said that the guys were like look uh, girl or look sweetie or whatever do you find that um, do, you, do you find that there's any expectation especially as being a female entrepreneur that um, that you're not as seasoned or do you find that people are a little condescending or do you find that it's more difficult or more challenging? It may not be. It may totally be like everything is cool. Well, but do you ever get that? I'm pretty upfront about with people about the fact that this is my first time on this merry-go-round. So um, I, I don't I don't think there's been a ton of that. I will tell you one funny story and I, I hope that um, when Ramon sees this, if he sees this, he doesn't get upset about it. But when I actually went, I had been at the plant 
a number of times because that's where we did our uh, lab testing, our bench testing for all the formulas. So, you know, the guys in the blending room, they had seen me around and they knew who I was and they knew which product I was connected with. And when it actually came time for the day that we were putting it in the bottles for the first time, Michael, my husband, came down with me. And we were standing there at the the desk where they test, they, they do some tests like to test the pH level and the, the bricks, which is the, the sugar level. They, they test all that right as they're blending it to make sure that it meets the standards in the formula so that they conform with what the state has required. Um, and we were standing there and Ramon said something about like, oh, well, it must be good after all those times of coming down here to, you know, finally you know, to, to finally come down and see it happening. And I said, yeah, and I'm really glad that Michael was able to come with me. And he said, well, he's got to see what he's paying for, right? <laughs> a and I stopped and I looked at him and I said, well, actually, um, I don't know if you think this is some, like, bored housewife project, but I'm paying for this. This is the money I earned through my consulting business that I am using to find... And he kind of, he was like, he was very embarrassed, he kind of backtracked, and I know he didn't mean any harm by it, but I think there are a lot of kind of hobbyists who come in and they, they're doing this because their spouse has a big job and is making a lot of money and they're kind of looking for something to do. And um, so that's the only time that I really sort of hit me a little bit that there might be this perception that I was just kind of a bored housewife. So... But other than that, it hasn't been too bad. Um, I thought you were, were going to say something like um, someone at the factory was going to look at him and say, you know, uh, something about like he owned the company. Because I get that a lot. <laughs> I get that a lot. I'm always like, what? What did you just say? <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I think there are other women-owned businesses. Uh, there are more women-owned businesses in the food space, I think, than any other. So, yeah, whatever. It was just a passing thing. It was kind of funny. And, you know, we laughed it off, and I didn't feel too bad. So, <laughs> interesting. Now, for those of, for those folks who are watching at home, we, we have about 15 minutes left for the show. Uh, what's some advice you want to give someone who's just starting out, who's just kind of thinking, oh, I want to start this company. Um, what's, some, what's some key advice that maybe you got or that you learned that you can pass on? So, here's a piece of advice that I got from uh, Whole Foods, actually. So, I went here. Let me just share my screen for a minute because so I want to show a few things. Um, Erica, while you're doing that, I want to yeah. give a shout out to some folks on uh, Twitter. We have Judy tuning in from Two Broads Abroad. Hey, Judy, it was really great to see hey, you Judy. at, uh, at uh, uh, Tech Munch, and then thanks for joining us today. Uh, we've got Jean from uh, Delightful Repast. Hey, Jean, how are you doing? And uh, Figtails has tuned in, um, and uh, this is this is key. She's thinking about how she can style her hair so she can have her headphones in while listening to Kitchen Party during a sales dinner. So I think she gets award for most dedicated uh, wow. <laughs> a viewer today. So well, <laughs> thanks for thanks for tuning in. We're so glad you're with us. <laughs> also on Google Plus, we got Jean Layton also chimed in. Uh, Beth Lee, Courtney Lopez, Danielle Nichols. Uh, Deb Healing, uh, Stephen Swimmer, and we got uh, Andrea. Oh gosh, Andrea, I'm going to totally butcher this last name, but I love it. It's Budawijin. Budawijin. It's uh, Sarah K. Uh, Hoffman, who actually is about to launch her own business. So, Sarah, you should put on. Uh, um, it's a loving spoon. Uh, I don't know if that's a catering company or if that's a product. But post in our Google Plus page or on Twitter what what your product is, so we can um, we can all hear what it is and support you as well. Um, so uh, in terms, so you're going to share your screen. Let's see. Yeah. Can screen. you can you see the picture that's up uh -huh. on my screen now? Okay. So this is a picture from uh, Whole Foods in Tustin. They have uh, I think a couple times a year they have a seminar called Local 101 where they invite local artisan food companies to come in and learn what it takes to get a product on the shelves at Whole Foods. So um, Whole Foods is very committed to having local food businesses and, and really starting people in their home store and then building out from there. So the, the guy with the microphone is Dwight Detter. He's the lead forager for Orange County and San Diego County. And the one thing that he said that really stuck with me was he looked around this room and there must have been a hundred people there and he said, I gotta tell you guys, 
if you're making a Me Too product, it's not getting on our shelves. You better be making something that you can prove to me is different and better and different. You've got to have a story that makes it clear that this is something that we don't already have. So I would say lesson number one is make sure you have a product that is truly unique. If you're making jam, I got to tell you, I walked around the fancy food show, the whole thing, there are a lot of people making jam. Jam is a crowded space. So that's number one. Uh, the second thing that I would say is take every opportunity to tell people what you're doing. So I don't know if you guys can see this. This is a picture of my lovely silver minivan with a car magnet on the side with my logo and under it it says dip differently and then has the URL. I actually put this on my van even before the product was in bottles, even before the website launched. And my husband, who's not in marketing, said, don't you want to wait till the website is up to have pay? And I said, no, this is about building interest and excitement. So everywhere I go, I have one of those on either side of my van, everybody can see it. And some of my food blogger friends have actually said, hey, if you make those for me, I'll put that on my van too. So oh, that's great. You know, I have, great. I tried to, when we first launched Bakespace.com, I tried to do license plates holders and Eric was like no don't do that and I said why and he said what if I drive terribly people will know <laughs> they'll associate it with the brand I'm like no that's not the case and I was like let's do it let's do it and he's like no 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 so six seven years later <laughs> I'm like, so so that's another thing um, the third thing I would say is get used to the fact that you are going to spend virtually all of your free time out there showing people and demoing your product. So this is a picture from Wine Expo, which is a really great wine shop in Santa Monica. They were the first people to carry Not Ketchup, and in fact, I brought cases of Not Ketchup straight from the factory on that very first day to Wine Expo. They were still warm when I handed them over. Um, and Wine Expo, I knew them through Twitter, and you know, I've been a food blogger for five years. I've come in contact with a lot of local food businesses in LA and um, Roberto from Wine Expo saw me tweeting about Not Ketchup and I started tweeting about it a month before I actually had it available to sell and he tweeted at me and said, hey, that sounds like something we might want to sell and I said, great, when can I bring it over? So um, Wine Expo on Thursday nights has this great uh, wine tasting thing where you can get 20 tastes of wine for 20 bucks. I personally had to stop after the whites because I'm a lightweight, but um, it's a great deal. And the grilled cheese truck was parked outside every Thursday in January. So on a Thursday, I went to the grilled cheese truck, I bought grilled cheese sandwiches and tater tots, I took them inside to the tasting room, I spread them out on the counter, I took bottles, I poured them into little dishes, and I stood there talking about not ketchup for three hours at least. Did I sell any bottles? Yeah, a few bottles got sold that night, but more importantly, people were exposed to the product. They got to taste it. They saw the brand so that the next time they see it, whether it's in Whole Foods or Bob's Market or wherever, they'll say, oh yeah, I met that woman. She was, she was nice. That tasted pretty good. I think I'll get some. So be prepared to spend virtually all your free time getting people to taste your product. Um, and then the fourth thing I would say is invest in your website. I mean, come on, it's 2014. We can't do anything without a website. And I was very lucky because uh, Christina Peters, who's an amazing food photographer, she shoots burgers for, you know, Carl's Jr. and McDonald's, and she's a great food photographer. Um, she's someone I had known through the Food Blogging Network uh, here in LA, and when I told her about this product, she gave me a great startup rate, and I went there, and for 13 hours, all we did was take pictures of not ketchup. We took pictures of not ketchup on food, in bottles, me with not ketchup, we, we did everything. And so, because of that, the website that we put together, I mean, I don't know what you guys think, but I think these pictures are gorgeous. And I'm really proud to have my product presented in a way that makes it look thoroughly professional. So there are certain things I think you have to invest in even at the beginning. Good pictures, a good easy to navigate website. Um, you know, you have to get your social media up and running. You have to be willing to ask favors of every friend, family, acquaintance, everyone 
to get this thing up and going. And people who know you and love you will be happy to help you. So that's my general advice. My very specific advice is insurance, liability insurance from day one. That's it. Have what about it. the website for developing it? What was that? Because, um, I mean, I've developed a website. I've developed many websites. But my product is the entire website. So right. there's, you know, profiles and cookbooks and, and all these different elements that go into this, um, to developing that. How did you find a web developer that you liked? Like for a, for a small business, someone who's thinking about who's, who's maybe not a tech person, how did you go about finding the right fit for you? Well, so again, you know, I'm really lucky. I have this great network of friends and colleagues, and uh, my friend Shara Karasik, who um, has been a, a web developer, and you know, we've worked together. We we worked together at a couple of my jobs ago, and she develops websites for small businesses. So I went to her and I said, "This is what I have to do. Here's my budget." And we split it up. So she did the stuff I really couldn't do, like basically the framework. I wrote all the content. You know, she basically put up the site on a hidden development server, and I went into WordPress. It's built in WordPress, and I did that on purpose because I wanted something I was going to be able to update. So she kind of put in dummy copy, you know, recipes, go here, write something about recipes. And I went in and I wrote all the copy. And then when we had the photos, which was the day after it was in bottles, then we were able to um, get the website up, including all the e-commerce, in just three days after, because the whole framework was done already. But let me tell you, December was a really busy month. <laughs> I could imagine with the holidays and also um, getting a business out. So we only have about four minutes left to the show. Um, Renee, did you want to uh, anything that you learned from the from your interview, Renee? That you would, we were surprised about not catch up or anything that you want to share from the LA Times piece? Uh, it was very much, I was very much surprised at how, um, maybe this wasn't exactly surprising, but how it really takes a village to put something like this together and how you really have to draw on your community and uh, and tap into that and not be afraid to tap into that and uh, I, I enjoyed hearing Erica talk about that because I feel like the, like being able to put together that network and really have people pull together, it encourages other people to follow their dream and it may not be to put together a line of condiments, it may be something else and I just think that's a that's a great thing and uh, um, I just found it very inspiring. Yeah, well the community, I mean the food blogging community in LA has been amazingly supportive and you know when Patty Landre and I founded Food Bloggers Los Angeles four and a half years ago, I didn't found it thinking, oh, and someday I'm going to need this community to help me build a business. But the fact that we've been working together as a community for four and a half years enabled me to go to them and say, look, I really need your help. And people were just so generous with their time and with their words, um, both on social media and on their blogs. And I was able to capture all of that and feed that into my website so that um, like if you go to my website and there's a, a category called buzz, that's screenshots of all the social media I've been able to capture, you know, where people are talking about not ketchup. And let me tell you, when you sit down with a buyer and you say, here's my product and people really seem to like it, oh and by the way, here are the 250 tweets and Facebook posts that people have been talking about my product with. Here are the pictures of the recipes they've made with it. Here are the testimonials that they're saying about what they, I, it's so powerful because, so here's the other lesson I would say, making a good product is not enough. It's not enough. When you sit down with a retail chain, they want to know, are you going to be able to help us sell this? Because it's not their responsibility to sell it once it's on the shelf. It's my responsibility to make people want to go into the store and buy it. So being able to show that you have the marketing chops, whether it's you or somebody that you're partnering with, to be able to build enough buzz and talk around your product, hugely helpful. And you're probably not going to get into major retail without it. So. Have, you, have you had any surprises like... Um someone you've emailed someone and you, you know they've said yes come in let me test the info you know let me let me test the product or they've emailed and said oh we're not accepting new submissions now have there been any of those like ups and downs um there have been ups definitely i've gotten 
emails just based actually on Renee's article in the LA Times from when I say major retailers, I'm talking about huge, you can't even imagine how huge retailers. Um, so that's, that's a great up, that's a great surprise. Um, I actually had uh, somebody at a big chain that I would really like to be in say, I like the product, but, and she had some issues with the flavor profile, and, you know, I think some of that's personal taste, and, um, oh well, I, she didn't say we're not going to take it, she just said, I wish it had X, and mm, I wish I could do that too, but I wasn't able to. So it's not that she brought up something I wasn't aware of, it's just one of the compromises. Oh, and I know we're almost out of time, but just I wanted to talk really, can I briefly, about the compromise issue? So um, I was really clear that I wanted this product to have unprocessed sweeteners and wanted to keep it as natural as possible, and um, my lovely and seasoned food technologist kept pushing back on me saying, particularly in that we were, we were talking about thickeners, and we were talking about what's called natural flavors, which are basically flavor boosters. And he kept saying to me, look, what it tastes like today is not important. It's what it tastes like in 12 months, because it has a 12-month shelf life. And so in a product like this that's a high acid environment, the, the natural flavors of the fruit that are in the fruit, they get overpowered by the acid. And in his experience, adding what are called natural flavors, which are um, you know things basically concentrated flavors and aromas from fruits, but they're made in a lab, not, they don't, you know, it's not a piece of fruit, um, was really important. And I fought it for a long time, and then I realized he's done this 200 times, and I haven't done it at all. So certain compromises I felt like I needed to make, couldn't find a way to get the texture consistent without adding xanthan gum, which was, which is fine and is on Whole Foods approved list, but I was just I wanted to keep it really natural, but almost every product out there that's in a bottle has xanthan gum, and now I know why because it does a really good job of thickening it and keeping the texture consistent over time. So and it's kind of what we demand as consumers, right? Yeah. Because on one hand, we can be critical of that kind of stuff, but if something comes out and it doesn't have the perfect consistency to it, then we're unhappy with that. Exactly. Exactly. So we're finicky. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I think that's a great place to end because the idea of uh, the product in 12 months, I w it'll be interesting. Come back in 12 months and let us let us know um, how that is because I'm sure the company is going to just go through the roof um, for sure. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Erica. Where can people find uh, the product or find out more about where, where it is in stores? So you can find it, well, it's in stores in LA plus one store in Orange County. Um, they're listed on my website at notketchup.com. Um, and it's also available online, so if you're not in LA and you want to try it, you can order it online. There's free shipping if you buy three bottles or more. Um, and uh, yeah, and we're finally figuring out exactly how much bubble wrap needs to go around those bottles so that they arrive intact. That's uh, another of the experimentations. <laughs> are you are you buying? Are you at the point where you're buying bubble wrap by the bulk? We have a really big roll of bubble wrap in our living room. <laughs> A lot of bubble wrap in our house. <laughs> I think that should be the new. They used to say, um, you all, you you know, be, uh, make sure you don't make enemies with people who buy ink by the barrel. To like about newspapers, like you don't want to make an enemy of a newspaper. That used to be the saying. I think the new saying needs to be now, like uh, people who buy bulk of um, <laughs> those little like pip, 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 what are those called? Those little. <laughs> You guys are you're like, she's losing it. I just I did have some beer, so I have to say that's fine, my a little bit of my excuse. Um, it was wonderful to have you. Um, Erica, we hope you come back and tell us about the company, tell us what's new, especially if you have a new flavor that you announce. Um, Renee, always great to see you. It was so nice to see you at Tech Munch last week. Um, for those of you who are interested, next week we have a show. Um, it's gonna be a little bit different. We have a, a local author for here from Los Angeles who 
wrote a book that has to do with cooking, but also love and divorce. And I thought it would be just so much fun for, um, and she's like this crazy, awesome uh, English woman who her husband was famous, a music guy, and she just has like these crazy stories. And I'm like, we have to have you on Kitchen Party. Love it, love um, it. So make, make sure you bring your booze next week, and uh, we will see you later. If you guys have any questions, you can find us at bakespace.com slash live as in like our live programming. You can find all of our shows. You can also find us on YouTube at Bakespace is our um, username and also on Google Plus, on Twitter, where else? On Pinterest, <laughs> on Facebook. Everywhere. <laughs> Just everywhere. Um, we will see you guys soon and thank you so much Erica for, for joining us. Always thank you for having me. It was great. Awesome. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye. Now,